as in a mirror, the history of civilization is reflected in our clothes. Now, it is more than the second skin, and fashion and style have become a way of self-expression. It is absolutely in style of the Kazakhs to see a deep symbolism, speak through things, objects, and rituals in material surrounding. Therefore, the history of national costume is a wonderful world, revealing our mentality. Each of us can clearly remember our own or someone else's outfit that looked special. If you think carefully, then you will probably be able to think of some garments with the history. This could be heirlooms, a family ring or an old scarf. There are some memorable examples in the world of fashion and in the history of the nomadic costumes too. And this is something we want to talk about today. This episode is dedicated to the unique costumes of the Kazakh people. A huge amount of various types of clothes are produced in the world today, but only a few of them can be considered unique. Some examples to this fact we can find in cinema. Take American costume designer William Travilla, for instance. He made several outfits for the Hollywood star Marilyn Monroe. One of them, a pleated white dress, has become an integral part of the image of the actress and a significant part of the life of the sex symbol of the 20th century. In the same years, the media intensively followed the story of another outfit. A pink elegant Chanel suit has become the example of a tragic uniqueness. It was worn by the First Lady of the United States, Jacqueline Kennedy, on the day her husband, President John F. Kennedy, was killed. There were smears of blood on the clothes. The widow deliberately wore the suit for the funeral. Since then, the outfit has become one of the symbols of American tragedy. A journey into the history of clothing is associated with many aspects of society, including ethnography and archaeology. Thanks to the discoveries scholars make, we can understand what our predecessors wore and what the process of costume making looked like in different eras. These kinds of artifacts and subsequent reconstructions are related to unique costumes. Back in the period of the 4th-3rd centuries BC, various nomadic tribes and ethnic groups lived on the territory of modern East Kazakhstan. In 2013, when the excavation of a burial mound in the Ujjar district took place, archaeologists discovered a female grave with the remains of fabrics, gold jewelry, and a headdress in it. The appearance in the costume of a noble nomad woman was restored. The shape and ornamental decoration of finding resembled traditional Kazakh female headwear, like Saukile and Borik. Therefore, the finding was called the Urjar Princess or the Urjar Priestess. Now it's considered as one of the most impressive images. The unique outfit of the Asian nomad female became the pride of a whole period in our domestic history. And now let us time travel to the 19th century to the period when the inner bouquet ort existed on the territory between the Volga and the Ural rivers. Hanjangir rode there, together with his wife Fatima. He attended the coronation of the Russian emperor and often received many travelers. Some of them wrote about Hansha Fatima and her unique outfits. For example, the wife of one of the scholars, Alexandra Pechtin, recalled, Her Fatima's face is Asian, but features are nice and pleasant. Her outfit added to her charms. It was a combination of both wealth and good taste. She was wearing a satin shirt with a quarter-width golden fringe at its hem and belted with a white golden belt. Over her shirt, she was wearing a raspberry-colored Turkish-style dress with golden braids and narrow fringe. Her neck was adorned with a necklace made of large pearls and diamonds, fastened with a rich clasp. Our museum stores unique clothes. The way they were performed is unique. Firstly, the camisole dress of Hansha Fatima, the wife of the last Kazakh Khan, Jangir. This is the middle of the 19th century. It was made of velvet and embroidery. It's an exemplary work, let's say. There are no clothes that were made with such elegance and craftsmanship. They simply didn't make it to our days. 
When we check our museum record books, revise our history, we see that the attitude to the Kazakh material culture was rather odious in the Soviet regime. They said Kazakhs have stepped over from the elite to the socialist system. And when such things were shown, they said that they were not typical. From a modern perspective, every costume of a nomadic mobility was unique and irreplaceable. Clothes and accessories were handmade. They were embroidered, often with gold threads, inlaid with precious and semi-precious stones, decorated with luxurious furs and exclusively natural materials were used, leather, silk, velvet, even bird feathers, for their production. Ethnographic sources mention an unusual swan fluff coat. It belonged to Tajibai, the youngest sister of the Kazakh aristocrat and scholar Shakan Walikhanov. Kazakhs have long considered a swan as a sacred bird. Most likely, local hunters didn't kill swans in order to sew an outfit for the Genghisid girl. There is a version that valuable bird skins and fluff could be offered to local craftsmen by visiting merchants. As we say, Kazakhs were very pragmatic people. They didn't kill birds themselves, but they bought the materials. This fur coat was sewn from skins. Tajibai's sister-in-law inherited it, then her daughter did, and thus, somewhere in the 50s, we got the fur coat. It was given to us by Akimbekov, a relative of Shokan Valikhana from his mother's side. That's how it was gradually handed down. It's worth noting that the style of the fur coat is fitted. It corresponds to the fashion of the beginning of the 20th century, European style. As you can see, the costume turns into a unique one, also because it enriches our knowledge about a specific historical period. From the history of the Genghisid code alone, one can understand how new materials were introduced in the steppe and how the steppe gradually entered the sphere of interests of the Russian Empire. It's known that it was during that period that many unique clothes, accessories, carpets, and other works of the Kazakh people were presented as gifts to the Russian emperors. And now we also found in the sources that in the 1905-1906, one of the Romanovs ordered his fur coat to be remade in accordance with modern fashion. Initially, the coat was a traditional Kazakh-style coat with a tunic-shaped sleeve. It is long, the sleeves are very long, as you see. A very long sleeve, it was intrinsic for both Russians and Kazakhs. This part of the Eurasian continent, Russia and other eastern parts, where Tatars, Kazakhs, Russians used to live. The entire aristocracy wore such long sleeves. Another amazing outfit is kept in the Ethnographic Museum in St. Petersburg. This is a coat made of pheasant skins. The unusual thing about the fur was the fact that furriers used peacock feathers for decoration. The fur coat was part of the bride's dowry. It was sewn following a similar technology that was employed with Tejabai's outfit. It was not only a beautiful and practical thing, it also had a ritual meaning. Indeed, for nomads, a pheasant was a mascot bird that was considered to bring happiness, wealth, and success. The fur coat was made of Chinese silk. Fluff from the head and neck of the Jitasu pheasant was used too. The sleeve, hem, and collar were trimmed with otter fur. Now I want to tell how fluff material from bird skins, pheasant feathers in particular, were considered as protective ones. They are impractical and not as durable as clothes made of sheepskin or fur. In this case, it's clear that the fur coat had a more ritualistic meaning. Moreover, a hundred pheasants must have been used in order to make such a coat. The fur coat was bought by the museum from some merchant. But according to sources, according to their information, the item was sewn in the Kagan district of Almaty region. 
Another important fact is that there is a certain secret meaning related to this outfit, which originated many centuries ago. Since time immemorial, pheasants and other birds of the pheasant family were associated with the god of sun, especially among the ancient Iranian peoples. Not only noble people or historical figures used to wear unique costumes. Let's have a look at the domestic cinema, for instance. In the 1970s, the director Sultan Khojikov made a film based on the ancient epic, Khojibek, and the talented artist Ulfairus Ismailova came up with the outfits for the main character. We attribute Khojibek's dress, embroidered camisole, and rich salkilia to unique outfits, too. They have greatly influenced the concepts of how female nomads, and specifically Kazakh brides, could look like. Since then, this image has migrated to the theater, cinema stage, and catwalk. Naturally, all the costumes and scenery that were made by Gulfairus Ismailova bear a huge historical value. One cannot overestimate the portraits that she made both of our ballerinas and of the artists in general. She had such an original perception, her own look, her understanding of colors. For example, she did the scenery for the Swan Lake, which is no longer on stage, but it reappears there from time to time. She had her own specific perception. Understanding of color scheme because she was a very special artist. Naturally, she left her mark. Her individuality and her perception of colors were transmitted to the viewers. And of course, the costumes that were created by Gulfairus Ismailova, both for films and our performances, they are all of great interest and will remain in history forever. Because she was a unique artist and, of course, she has influenced the development of both costumes and attitude to the costume. What else makes the costume unique? Apart from the fact that it's often made in a single copy, sometimes embroidery or applique are important. In the old days, craftswomen introduced the chain stitch technique in their works. Today, it's of course a rarity. But the applique is very popular, especially when creating theatrical costumes. I think that the chain stitch should be used more and as a rule because it's beautiful and it's a sign of a high quality. It's much better than manual work or applique. We tried the appliques. Two, it was in the play Abai. The production was made by Italians. They were invited and this production, which is staged at the opening of every season, is very interesting. Because there was a manual applique, layers of several fabrics were made. The ornament was naturally formed by these layers. As for theatrical costumes, as in the case of the dress of the movie character Kozhebek, there are some interesting examples. In 2016, a museum was founded at the Abai Kazakh State Academic Opera and Ballet Theater. It's a place for various collections of costumes and props from different productions. Many of them were worn by some outstanding artists who once shown on stage. These were Galina Ulanova, Sara Kusharbaeva, Raushan Baisitova, Rosa Vaglanova, Bibigur Duligenova, and others. Now these outfits are our heritage and our cultural value. Naturally, these costumes are iconic and represent our historical values. And they are already a rarity for our theater, as our theater has a long history, 85 years. We have already opened the theater's 86th season. So, of course, there are costumes in which the artists of our first productions performed. For example, Kalkaman Mamar, and so on, which are iconic. For example, the opera Khajibek or the opera Abai. Or say the costumes of Ibigur Tuligenova or the costumes of Yermek Sirkibayev. These are our famous artists who we are very proud of, and their costumes are also our pride. 
They're objects of value and pride. A special place at the museum is occupied by a dress in which the opera Deva Bibigulta Ligenova performed. A pink dress decorated with a national ornament attracts attention immediately. As a matter of fact, the outfit was altered several times. It depended both on the fashion trends of past years and on the wishes of the artist, who wore it in different years. What else, apart from the historical era, ornaments and decorations can turn a costume into a unique work of art? An important element is, of course, the choice of fabric. From ancient times, a special place in the life of nomads was occupied by felt. Carpets, yurts, household items and outerwear were made from it. And today, there are some spectacular designer garments, accessories and paintings that are made of this material. Kazakhstan is famous for its felt products. This is our traditional element and symbol, like a Japanese kimono or African masks. It represents Kazakhstan. There are many felt artists abroad, but they usually make clothes, some kitchen utensils, objects, flowers, and so on. Products of this kind. Felt, of course, remains a material mostly for handicraft. At this exhibition, the artist shows that this is not a mere handicraft, but that this is also a contemporary art. Each culture always has its own unique features. In the culture of Kazakhstan, Felt has always occupied a very important place. And in the context of this exhibition, it was important to emphasize that it doesn't matter how it is expressed in design, whether it is often used in clothes or even in industrial design, but that all of this is artwork. That is, the artist is trying to deliver some specific message. Since past centuries, many foreigners were amazed at the costume of nomads. For example, in the 16th century, an Italian historian and collector, Paolo Giovio, wrote, in addition to herds of fast horses and famous white cloths, not woven from threads but knitted from wool, they are used to make felt cloaks, which serve as good protection from rain in any weather, and they are very beautiful. Modern domestic designers create unique garments by combining the old and the new. Some choose a bright ornament, some prefer a Kazakh chain stitch, and others use traditional fabrics in their collections. One of the designers who revive clothes made of felt was Aya Bapani, who works delight both locals and foreigners. Beloved by nomads, the felt is perfect for fashionable outfits. Since my project is based specifically on Central Asian culture, especially Kazakh, nomadic culture, I opted for my favorite felt. Felt is our oldest non-woven material. It can even be said to be mystical. Because there are many legends about felt. Even when I stage my shows, I see how magically felt affects the audience. I took the felt as a basis, but I took the traditional felt and improved it, made it softer, thinner, more elastic, so that it could be worn comfortably. In addition to their favorite felt, nomads often used skins of various animals. While hunting, they collected skins of martens, arctic foxes, wolves, badgers, and so on. By the way, in ancient times it was impossible to hunt for an otter, as there was punishment for its murder. However, otter fur was common in Kazakh female costume. It was used for decoration of the traditional headdress of the bride, Saukilia. The otter, according to the Avesta in Zoroastrianism, was a special animal of the goddess Aredvi Sura Anahita, the patroness of the feminine birth and fertility. She was associated with land and water. And the otter as an animal living in both environments, in water and on land, was especially revered. 
According to the descriptions of goddess, she was dressed in a cloak made from 300 beaver skins, and it looked like silver, and killing an otter was equivalent to killing a person. And if for the killing of a person it was possible to pray for forgiveness, then the killing of an otter could not be forgiven. This was well written about by Akishev, our famous scholar. In this case, this is an example of an attitude of the Kazakh material, spiritual culture, to the otter, because it belonged to sacred animals. I'm talking about a swan just like that. Otter belonged to the sacred animals too. Surely someone from modern designers wants to create a unique outfit that will glorify him or her. Someone draws inspiration from history, someone is inspired by national ornaments, and someone is trying to combine seemingly incompatible things. Georgian designers, for example, are inspired by Choha, male outerwear of the Caucasian people, and the Kartuli dance, also known as Lesginka. There is another example from Italy. Fashion designer Bianca Luini runs an online blog called Where I See Fashion. In her collages, she compares dresses from fashion shows or fashion shootings with architecture, animals, and plants. Kazakh creative personalities have their own way too. Carpets, Tekimet, and Sermak, I get my patterns from there and use them in my collection. A certain detail can become the basis for the entire collection. And the next collection can be even more bold with a different character, with the addition of metals, jewelry, a modernized. I take the national jewelry as the basis and create a modern interpretation of it. Sometimes a runway outfit can steal the thunder during stars' red carpet appearance and later can be covered by all the tabloids. This happened with the dress of Gianni Versace. Singer and actress Jennifer Lopez wore it at the Oscar ceremony, and the outfit played a key role in the image of the pop diva. Kazakh stars also opt for designer clothes. Today, local celebrities wear outfits made by domestic fashion designers more and more. I love to present my work to the world to demonstrate our Kazakh art. I want people to see how I adapt it to modern fashion. All my works are haute couture outfits, but even being haute couture, they possess some intrinsic national features. These collections are always bright and eye-catching. They possess a character, but the whole image is traditional and it pleases the eye. Because in our culture we have colorful patterns, some great dynamics of the patterns in the color scheme is so rich and saturated. Well, Central Asian traditional outfits are all very colorful, and Western European audience reacts quite emotionally to it. This combination of colors, the dynamics of patterns affect people greatly because Western people got used to seeing beige and gray classic collections. And then when they see our Kazakh step fashion, it immediately excites their imagination. Surely many of us can recall an example when it was an outfit that turned a certain person into a famous figure or a real star. Then everyone started to follow this public personality, watching how their taste and clothing preferences developed. But only in rare cases, the life of a celebrity, the story around the iconic costume turns the outfit into a unique and even rarer thing. But old clothes in museums and especially archaeological findings have already passed the test of time. Even distant from fashion, people can learn more and more about unique costumes created in the steppe every day. These examples are everywhere, in history books, in museums, at exhibitions. They are talked about on the internet, on television, and in fashion magazines. These clothes remain timeless, they are unique, and certainly cannot be subjected to following any fashion trends. 
It's part of the rich culture of the Kazakh people, and that's why it's so valuable to all of us.